Hey everyone, it's Ben here and welcome back to Rare Liquid Careers and I'm currently in Korea right now but for this upcoming interview, I actually filmed it a few weeks back when I was in Pennsylvania for school. Right now I'm in Korea for my summer immersion experience which I made a video about recently if you want to check that out. The last thing I want to mention is that I am actually in the middle of building out a how to get into MBA course and I think it's going to be a really really great product and just course for anyone interested in applying for an MBA. Something that I wish that I had when I was applying. So if you're interested, I'm giving a huge discount to people who sign up early. So I'll leave a link to that in the description. And with that said, let's go into the interview. Um, Anna's gonna give her background and everything. And she has a lot of really great experience in startups and venture capital. So I hope you all enjoy the video. So hey everyone, as I mentioned, this is Anna. And we'll just jump straight into the interview. Um, Anna, can you first just give us a little bit of background about who you are and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so hi everyone on Ben's channel. Um, I'm Anna and I'm Canadian of Colombian descent. I um, previously worked in startups and VC after graduating with a business undergrad from Queen's University. And I just started at Wharton Lauder in the same program as Ben and my concentration is on the LATAM region. Awesome, and can you tell us a bit about like your previous work experiences, like where you worked and what you did before the MBA? Yeah, so I worked mainly in early stage startups after graduating to different pre-IPO companies based in Toronto. And after those experiences in strategy and operations roles, I moved over to the VC side, leading platform and operations at an early stage fund. Got it. All right, so thank you for sharing a bit about your background. And, you know, I'm curious to know, like, what got you interested in the startup world? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I did a business undergrad and there were a lot of very traditional industries that would come and recruit on campus. So like your banking, your consulting, all that. Um, and I saw that early on in my university career and was like, I don't know if this is for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know like what the self-selection was about, whether I like actually didn't like these jobs or if I just like wanted to do something a little different and chart my own path. Um, at the same time, I was very involved in undergrad. I did a lot of conferences and activities and clubs. And through one of those clubs, I met an executive at Shopify. Mm. And it really kind of opened this new window into tech for me. I followed up and got in touch with a few different people and kind of decision-making roles at Shopify and landed an internship prior to my final year of university. Um, and that was an awesome experience. I met so many really cool people. I was doing really impactful work on a kind of new part of the business. And that really convinced me that I wanted to work in tech because mm. there were so many jobs that didn't exist, companies that were kind of just figuring things out from the ground. And I kind of saw a lot of these other jobs as like just plugging people in to roles and functions that were already so predefined and I kind of thought I would do something a little different. <laughs> awesome and you kind of mentioned kind of making more of that kind of impact and I think that's what a lot of people are very what, what draws them to kind of like the startup world um, and so oftentimes though the startup world can be seen a little bit as glamorous um, because you're doing so many like cool things that are shaping industries. Um, but what do you, is there anything about the startup world from your experience that, you know, not a lot of people know about? Because a lot of times you have to actually kind of roll up your sleeves and really get into the weeds of something. Sometimes do things that, you know, other people may not really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anything about the startup world that you feel like is not really well covered that you want to share? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that like I started working in tech when the the idea of it and the way it was marketed externally was very much like ping pong and beer at the mm. office. And I guess as a young person, that was kind of nice. It made it easy to make a lot of friends and there like were and still exists a lot of perks in tech. But I think the one thing that is kind of um, maybe less known about jobs in tech is that especially as like a, a business person, and in early stage startups, you are going to be a generalist. So mm. 
or in a lot of cases. So if you're someone that like wants to see your first job is like building a lot of like very concrete skills and becoming a specialist, that may not be the case in your first job in tech. You might like be doing like user interviews one day and then PR another day and then email marketing. So if you want to kind of leave a job saying like, you know, I became like super proficient in like XYZ software and like drove all these results. Like, I think you'll have a lot of sound bites of learning new skills and being flexible and adaptable, but I don't know if like you will necessarily like come out of it with, you know, some deep expertise in a given function. Mm -hmm. That actually brings up an interesting point because I've also, you know, as some of you guys may know, uh, been working as kind of an entrepreneur over the past four years or so. And the work that you do is always changing and there's different ideas that come around. Um, and it seems like you've had that kind of experience as well, working on so many different types of uh, work streams as kind of like the generalist, as you mentioned. So what, are, what do you feel like throughout all those experiences were some of the most valuable skills you gained working in operations at a startup? Mm. I think that there's some core, more quantitative skills that you develop. Um, it's going to be a superpower if you have some analytical skills, like you can like pull your own data from the databases using mm. SQL or like do the later analysis on Python. I think those are super valuable skills. And I recommend that if you're looking to make a transition into tech from a different industry that you, you know, put a few of those tools in your toolbox. Um, I'd say that like beyond that, like a lot of the a lot of the skills that like end up being more transferable are things like picking up new tools and um, and functions quickly. In my first job after undergrad, I kind of did design my own rotation at a, an accounting fintech company and I was starting out in sales operations and I learned how to use Salesforce and then I worked a lot more with the product team and did user research for a new line of business. I eventually ended up on the strategy side and I was doing some M&A work under the VP of strategy. And I think that just being someone that's like very open to collaborating with new people and picking up new skills will honestly set you apart because there are a lot of people that kind of like come into tech like very entitled, like I wanna do this mm. work and this work only. And I think that kind of having an open attitude is like one of the biggest ways that you can differentiate yourself and set yourself up for success. Mm. And you've worked on so many different things. Um, is there anything that you feel like you're most proud of or like anything that you worked on that um, you feel like you, when you're looking back, you're like, wow, I'm really uh, proud that I accomplished this at my startup because as we kind of have been discussing, there's a lot of impact you can make in these like small teams. Is there anything that comes to mind? Or like, if not, then maybe like a favorite memory or whatever comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> this is like starting to sound like a real interview, Ben. <laughs> You're like trying to hire me for my next job. <laughs> what was the most impactful moment? Um, and this is actually something I do use in, in interviews, and I mm. think I mentioned in the latter one, but um, I worked at, um, at an e-commerce startup prior to, to joining the VC world, and our main line of business is called Snap Commerce, and Snap Commerce was the kind of like overarching company, and then the main product and line of business was Snap Travel. Steph Curry is actually one of the oh, investors cool. in us, so go Warriors! Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyways, I was working at a travel e-commerce startup during the pandemic, and like you know, within forty-eight hours, like huge shocks to the business we were like having a lot of existential questions mm. of like whether or not we would be able to weather the storm and working in operations at the time a lot of my role was related to customer service operations and how we would manage our call center in the philippines and kind of set them up with tools and processes that would help them deliver service um, effectively so that was a really challenging but super rewarding experience where we were working in the operations team with the finance team to make sure that like we're not like going out of pocket or being at a lot of like being put in a situation of financial risk we were working with the product and engineering teams to make sure that like we were building tools that would help us kind of deliver customer service um 
at scale because you can't really have like people calling in when it's literally like everyone wants to cancel the reservation i mm. think at the beginning of the pandemic we were answering probably like five percent of phone calls and we were able to really really turn that around through like product solutions but like also like thinking about the financial implications and then working with people on the ground in our call center to, to deliver that so mm. it was a big big moment professionally yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds pretty challenging but i'm actually also curious were you able to ever go on like calls with steph curry or like meet him yeah he, oh, really? he came into the office um right before we announced our series a because there was a, a game with the raptors so he like mm. came in he did a talk it was so cool <laughs> yeah that's awesome what was he like in person um you know taller than i expected but mm. i'm also very short in comparison <laughs> but yeah very personable he has a lot of links to Canada, so he I think oh. he felt right at home. <laughs> what are his links to Canada? So Aisha is Canadian, or at least part oh, okay. Canadian, and then like his dad, I think, played for the Raptors for a while. Wow, that's really cool that you actually got to meet and work with Steph Curry. That's like a cool nugget that I didn't really expect from this conversation. But uh, now moving a little bit more towards what you did after your startup experience. Um, so you worked in venture capital. Can you tell us a little bit more about like your role and how was that transition moving from startup world to the venture capital side? Yeah, so I think my experience at Snap Travel and Snap Commerce was awesome, but also I think very tiring to, to go through like that transition during COVID. And I was really looking for a, a break from dealing with customer service. I wasn't, you know, um, doing customer service, but like he's, there's still like a lot of interaction mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens there. And at that point, I was also about like four years into working in startups, like at different stages, a lot of different um, experiences across industries from fintech, e-commerce, travel. And I felt that there was an opportunity to kind of like zoom out a bit and mm -hmm. be able to have an impact on a bigger scale. I guess I was having an impact at a startup in a function and, and delivering good results, but I was curious, like how would I be able to kind of take what I've learned from all these different startups that operate super differently and, and hopefully bring that to a wider audience. Um, and VC seemed like an awesome way to do that, like working with different founders, um, helping out, especially in the early stages where you're just trying to figure things out and, and get perspectives that can help you grow. And that's how I landed at Golden Ventures. Um, a friend from university introduced me and they were hiring for a platform and operations person, which in the VC world is basically like everything that's not investing. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about portfolio support, if you think about like fund operations, um, internal internal ops. It's kind of like all of those like under the hood and in front of house things. So it's an awesome experience that helps you really develop relationships with founders. You're working one on one with them after you close the deal and also gives you a lot of insight into how funds are managed and run, which is, I think, you know at the surface level super interesting and then as you get into it you're like whoa like this is like actually fascinating <laughs> mm. what what's like an example of something you found like really fascinating um i think that one thing that's like interesting about fund operations that like maybe like from the startup world you don't like initially recognize is that like you know each so each fund is kind of not managed independently, but it's its like own organization and you're like writing checks out of that fund and like kind of evaluating it relative to the other funds. And so there's like a very different like almost like culture and and performance for each fund. And I think like as you look into like the accounting side and the reporting side, it's, it's very interesting to see kind of the, the evolution and you can see like, oh, like this is when we started focusing on like this specific industry. And this is like when we widened it to like include like smaller checks in addition to our like main deals that we were leading. So I think that 
yeah, it's super interesting. And sometimes when you're just like reading headlines of like funding announcements and like who is participating, you don't always see some of like those deal dynamics. And it's pretty cool to have access to that information and, and start like um, understanding the other end of it. Mm. So yeah, I, th- I mean, what I kind of take from that is that a venture capital firm kind of just seems like it just fo- focuses on investing, but it's actually its own kind of company in itself or each fund is. And so seeing that history and seeing it expand, it's kind of maybe similar to how like a startup expands into different divisions or markets or creates new products or something like that. Um, so that's really interesting to hear. And I'm actually also curious with your time in the venture capital world, do you feel like you had some any like unexpected challenges that you didn't really foresee that you think would be kind of interesting to share? Mm. Yeah, I think that one thing about VC that like you might not recognize going in, especially switching from a startup environment where like the culture is very much like grow, get more users, more revenue, like more, more, more. And there's always this expectation of like this. Um, I think funds are very different in like the kind of organizational dynamics like it's not really an environment where you're like always adding more team members and like growing exponentially i think that like well-managed funds are, are relatively stable like you have like you know seven people in 2015 and maybe in 2018 you have eight or mm. still seven and it's like <laughs> it can still be a great fund that mm. has great returns so i think that some of those like organizational dynamics that play into that when like it's a relatively like um stable organization in terms of size is that like you you may not have like all of these like startup perks and and i think intuitively that's obvious it's like oh like yeah if you have seven people you probably don't have like a head of culture mm-hmm. and like an internal comms person and like all these other like frills that come along with startups um which is yeah it's a, a lifestyle change like if you're like in like the tech and startup world for the the beer and ping pong like you might miss that but there are a lot of other things gained. Mm. It sounds like you might have gotten really good at ping pong in your startup experience. <laughs> no, I was actually like the worst. Like we had like a, a Slack channel that like was kind of like a leaderboard. I, I participated maybe once. <laughs> <laughs> Probably still better than the average person though. Um, but I was actually curious, uh, as you were talking about the fund size and how it's very stable, I feel like most investment funds are pretty small and lean. Um, do you actually have any tips on how any of our viewers can break into venture capital? Mm-hmm. Given that, you know, because the teams stay relatively small, it might be hard to break in. Do you have any yeah. kind of tips? I think that some of the best experience you can get prior to going into VC is on the startup side. It really helps you relate to founders to to really seem like you're coming from a place of understanding and empathy if you know what it's like to Mm. start from zero and like live that like early stage seed stage series a experience i think it's like hugely valuable to to actually have been through that and to know what it's like to like you know not have that much money in the bank or to Mm. have a product that is like not really gaining traction and then you have to start like throwing things on the wall and seeing what sticks i think that's hugely valuable and and i think that Maybe your viewers knew that, know that, but if not, I'll drive it home again. <laughs> Got it. And having worked in startups myself for the past few years, I definitely know what it's like to not have a lot of money in the bank and like work on work streams that like aren't doing well and are doing well. So it's like you really get a huge spectrum in terms of your experience. Uh, and kind of on that note, do you have any pleasant surprises from working in venture capital that you didn't really think about when you were going into the role in VC? Um, Anything that stands out? Yeah, um, I'd say that, so I was at a seed stage fund, um, Golden Ventures. We invested in startups across North America at the seed stage, but that also meant that we were industry agnostic. So like you would have startups from temporary tattoos to Mm. quantum computing chips and then like B2B software is like somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Um, And so I was leading the um, platform and operation side, which is like, as I mentioned, like all of the services that we provide to, to our portfolio founders to help them grow and succeed. And I think that one thing that 
I really liked about my fund is that we weren't a fund that was like super like in your face about like we led this round and we like take credit for everything like we're the most awesome and like yeah like if they didn't have our money like they would have like tanked like we were like very much not a fund like that and mm. all credit to um the partners there for kind of keeping that that integrity and that like humility um but i think that like one really nice and unexpected I guess nugget from that experience is that like, you do sometimes see situations where you know a company is maybe going through a leadership change and um, it has a gap on the the founding team on the executive team and seeing the partners actually be hugely impactful in finding a new leader to step in and kind of turn things around. Mm. I think I thought that that was something that like only happened in like the PE side and not VC. I thought it was a little more hands off and that like, you know, you'd be like, well, like well, we're gonna write that one off. But there's an incredible example of a situation like that in the fund where a new leader was brought in and and you see this like remarkable turnaround going from a company that like you you don't know what the outcome is going to be to mm -hmm. one of the highest performing companies in the fund is just incredible and when you think about like the impact that you know working with this specific fund and the specific partner had on the outcome of that company it's like wow yeah pretty cool <laughs> oh that's really interesting to hear about how your venture capital firm and partners were able to really make a meaningful impact because yeah, like I think on the surface, venture capital often that seems often can seem like investors just writing a check and then kind of have you know letting go and just hoping that they like five x their money. So mm -hmm. it's like help, it's interesting to hear that like actual impact made. And now actually transitioning a bit more to um, your MBA experience so far and all of that. Uh, for those those of you who don't know, um, we're both in something called the Lauder program where we get a master's in international studies and an MBA at Penn. And the master's international studies part is, or getting that master's is why we actually started in June when most business schools start in the fall. And we learn about international history, economics, politics, and all of that. And we also have to be fluent in a foreign language. And so kind of, I wanted to provide you guys that background um, as I ask Anna this kind of next question of, you know, why did you decide to get an MBA and what made you interested in the Lauder program specifically? Yeah, so... I think that two things really spurred my interest. One, I've always wanted to go back to school. And I think that like, maybe this is like my immigrant head being programmed, like go back to school, get a <laughs> master's, like get an MBA, Ivy League, woo. Um, so that's always been like in the back of my head, like, oh, I wonder when I'm gonna go back to school, mm. what kind of program, where. Um, so that's like one thing and i think the other part was just like you know coming out of or being in covid hibernation i was mm. just like starved for connection <laughs> i was like wow i joined vc i'm gonna make so many new friends network every day and it was like just me on zoom so i think that i was really craving that social connection and i think you know outside of an mba there's lots of ways to do that but I think none are as efficient. You're not gonna make 800 friends in a year, mm -hmm. just like going out there and shaking hands and they probably won't be as fun. So <laughs> those are my two reasons. Got it. And what about Lauder specifically? So on the Lauder side, um, I think that like one very important thing was like, when I was thinking about grad school, it wasn't like default MBA. I was like considering some MPP programs, some like more social science type programs. And I think that Lauder is so unique in the sense, like there's no other program in the US or in the UK or anywhere else in the world that I've seen that manages to like get in that like, you know, you know, top MBA, like the Wharton MBA, but also like the, the liberal arts, social science aspect in a two year time frame. Like there are, there are other programs that will like take like the MBA and the, maybe an MPP. That's like a whole other year of your life. I'm too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really the interest. I was like, I really am interested in these social science questions and understanding more about the world around me. 
Um, but I also recognize that like there's a big opportunity cost associated being in school for another year. And, and Lauder really just like, you know, takes all those boxes and, and puts together such an incredible cohort of people from all over the world with such different backgrounds and experiences. And yeah, just, you know, is a, honestly a miracle program. I'm like, <laughs> how did I come across this? Like, I'm so glad I did. Yeah, we all we feel like we're already ambassadors for the Lauder program, even though it's only <laughs> been a few weeks. But kind of on that note, yeah, we just started our entire program on June 1st. Um, so it's only been a few weeks, but what, you know, what are your initial impressions so far? How are you enjoying your experience? Yeah, I, I think that the, the main takeaway in these past two weeks has been like, wow, like what a privilege to be around these people. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were on our first day, we kind of like went around the class and did like some short intros, like mm -hmm. very like basic like where were you born name and i think one fun fact and i think my takeaway from that experience was like wow you really cannot assume like you have people yeah. that are like you know born in one country and then like speak three other languages and are studying a fourth one through lauder and you just like really don't know what like incredible combination of like ex professional experience language lived experience from like you know, growing up in one region and then going to school in another, it's been honestly so, so inspiring to be around like people with such interesting perspectives and, and you know, yeah, to be in class with you and like also like stay up till like 3 a.m. with you. <laughs> like what, what a cool, <laughs> what a cool opportunity. Yeah. And by the way, Lauder is not sponsoring this video. We're not being paid but to talk about any of this. Um, but actually I was, curious when you were talking about um, the different like courses and everything you're interested in is there any were there any like key lessons or moments I know it's only been a few weeks but anything that you really like stood out to you of thinking as you were going through whatever experience that was like wow this is like really cool mm. um so we're just starting to like put together groups for like our thesis project, which I think you've mentioned in one of your videos. Um, we just put together our group, actually Ben and I are in a group together. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that, that whole process of like group forming and sharing ideas for a research topic, I think was just like really interesting, just like hearing everyone's like, um, I guess like more academic leanings because we've like heard a lot about people's professional experiences and we interact in class on some academic themes. but. It's really cool to think about um, how people are kind of exploring this like academic um, perspective through this research project and putting on their like researcher hats, demographer hats, um, economist hats, and and are starting to to kind of like form these ideas and, and think about like how we're going to get out into the field and interview and research people. I think that's like so cool and and yeah there's part of the magic of being in an arts program alongside uh the mba mm. yeah and our master's thesis is like 80 pages so i'm glad i have someone so <laughs> motivated to do well because it's gonna be a lot of writing um but you know we talked a lot about mbas and all that and i'm think a lot of people may be interested in kind of applying to mba programs in the future do you have any like top tips that you could share yeah I think that like, you know, beyond the, the studying for tests and putting together an application and thinking about like your past experiences and how to package those up neatly, I think that it's really important to think about, you know, what, what happens after and like, not just like what job am I going to have after my MBA, but also like, how old am I going to be? Where do I want to live? <laughs> like, who do I want to live with? Like all these big questions about, you know, lifestyle and like designing your life around your career, I think are super important because you're going to have a lot of career opportunities thrown at you and presented to you. And you're really going to have to make some introspective decisions about like what you want in the future and how you know these career and lifestyle decisions will fit into like all these other aspects of your life and yeah, kind of like staying true to your values in that way hmm. great thank you for sharing all your top tips for and hopefully that was helpful to everyone watching and 
Now we actually kind of want to wrap things up a little bit by going more onto the personal side of things so you can get to know Anna a little bit better. <laughs> um, but first is, you know, you worked in a pretty male dominated industry in venture capital and in, honestly, a lot of a lot of like the corporate world in general. And so do you feel like you have any advice for any of our female viewers who are watching and how they can kind of uh, succeed or do well in these kinds of environments? Yeah, I'd say that one thing I, I recommend people and, and women to, to think about when joining tech startups and VC is to kind of think about like the ownership of these companies and, and really advocate for yourself when negotiating in these mm. jobs. So in the tech side, like your offer for compensation is going to be made up of both salary and equity. And I would really think about like, how you negotiate the equity side of it and not just like be like, yeah, whatever you give me is fine. I think that this is something that I didn't do well in my first two jobs and I wish I had done. <laughs> so uh, really think about like, okay, if I'm joining this company, it's because I think it's going to succeed and I think that this equity is going to be worth something. And so if you believe that, like really try to to, to make a case for yourself to, to get more equity and to renegotiate for it as you get promotions and grow in the organization because that money could be life-changing. And I've met people who have had really awesome exits like, you know, at Shopify and like, you know, they don't really have to worry about working anymore. And like, what an awesome place to be in as, as a young professional where that's like something that like could help you gain a lot of financial flexibility down the road. Mm, yeah, negotiating is always tough, but definitely mm -hmm. worth it. Sorry, did you have anything else you wanted yeah, to add? Yeah, and, and on the VC side, it's a little different. You don't have options, but you can potentially make carry, which is a percentage of like the, the proceeds of any exit from the fund. So often like that's like very much like, um, like first it's the LPs and then it's the partners. And if you negotiate well as an associate or another person on the team, you can hopefully participate in that as well. And that's also potentially life-changing money if it's a really great fund that's making good investment decisions. So I'd say definitely advocate for yourself in both scenarios because in tech and NVC, you're really, um, you know, betting on the upside of like these companies like growing and, and exiting to the huge multiples. Mm -hmm. and if you're not participating that in that, then you're really like missing out and someone else is, <laughs> is getting all the upside. So definitely advocate for yourself there. Got it. And kind of along a similar um, wavelength, I guess, <laughs> like <laughs> if you could kind of go back to your college, Anna self, what kind of advice would you give her? Um, I'd say maybe do a little better in school. <laughs> I was not that focused on academics in undergrad. Thankfully, some some good studying for my uh, standardized tests helped me get through that in um, the MBA application process. But I think I could have saved myself a lot of stress in testing by just doing better in undergrad and having like a 4.0. <laughs> um, <laughs> so make sure you stay in school and do well. Yeah, basically. stay in school. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, I, I'd say like, you know, like, uh, I think that things turned out pretty well and I'm glad that I didn't like always like follow the the current of what my peers were doing and and kind of um, charted a path for myself and and I hope to continue doing that I think that like I'm gonna be in a similar situation in in the MBA where like a lot of people are are pursuing a, a pretty predefined path and like no no shade at all but like i just need to to kind of keep in mind what i wrote in my essays and, and what i kind of envisioned for my future and, and make sure that i kind of stay on track there got it i'll definitely do my best to make sure you don't go into banking or consulting <laughs> uh, i mean i'm a huge advocate for people doing things outside of the normal path but because you know i did the normal path and now i'm you know making youtube videos <laughs> uh but as a kind of closing question, you know, it seems like you have certain principles that really guide you um, as you were discussing going into like startups. And so just to kind of let everyone kind of know you a little bit more on a personal level, what are some values that kind of have directed your life? It doesn't have to have been 
your compass for you know the past 20 plus years but anything that comes to mind in terms of like personal values yeah i would say that integrity is a big one i would never want someone to think that i've misrepresented myself and and really think that like it's just so important to to who you are the reputation that you build and the relationships that you build that you like are are being honest and and kind of like keeping that um keeping that core to your actions and your words and i think another one is community it's I'm very extroverted. I'm someone that gets a lot of energy from the people I spend time with. And I think another big reason why I'm in the MBA is, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to make new friends and I want to build a strong community around me. And um, yeah, I think that I often make decisions like more around like, um, you know, optimizing for, you know, team happiness mm -hmm. <laughs> and kind of like making sure that, yeah, the, the the squad is is aligned and that's kind of like <laughs> how i make decisions <laughs> yeah that's great and sounds like if you ever start a business and you're watching and you want to work for her it sounds like she'll really kind of take care of you so that's great <laughs> <laughs> um, but that actually concludes the interview thank you anna so much for your time i think this was like really insightful conversation and hopefully you all found a lot of valuable nuggets here and there um, and yeah so that concludes the interview thank you all so much for watching and hope to catch you in the next video bye wave <laughs>